Thank you, Julie, for leading us in prayer. And I want to say um, a special welcome to anyone who's visiting with us. I understand we have a special visitor from Germany today, so we want to say welcome. And as it relates to people who are new to Canada, I believe Juan and Lena, you have some news for us. You're official now, uh, got their permanent resident uh, status, so we're very thankful for that. Obvious, obviously, they didn't lead, read my, rec my letter of recommendation. You got in anyway, so that's good, yeah? No, no, we're, we know that's a journey, and we celebrate that with you. Now, I wanted to begin with talking about the Mona Lena, I mean, the Mona Lisa uh, here. I knew, I did that purposely. Um, but, you know, I, I was thinking about great portraits. And if you think about maybe the most iconic portrait, painted portrait around, probably the Mona Lisa is one that might come to our minds, you know, just the, the press of the crowd um, to see it. We actually went by on a bus, a tour bus. Uh, we went by the Louvre in, in Paris and we saw the line, I don't know, how, it must have been like a kilometer long because it snaked, snaked along. And so we never got in to see it. We never even tried to get in that lineup. But, you know, I couldn't tell you anything about it. Uh, I couldn't, I, I, I could describe it, I suppose. Or, but, but I don't really know the person who is depicted here. I don't know, maybe you do. But I think that when it comes to our understanding of God, that can also be a challenge for us. We can have this vague notion of God. I think he's really good. You know, he's, he's out there somewhere. And, you know, our notion of who God is can unfortunately become rather superficial. It's not that we, don't, we aren't aware of him or we aren't thinking about him, but we need a more accurate picture, a, a, a clearer portrayal of who he is. And so what we're endeavoring to do in our current series, Behold Your God, is to look at a number of portraits. I think, uh, I think there's 19, I think uh, 21 sermons, but 19 portraits we're looking at, examining Isaiah 40 through 49 to understand who is the Holy One of Israel, uh, at least as Isaiah has portrayed him in, the, in the, his book. Now, Isaiah's book can be daunting. We've talked about that already. It has as many chapters uh, as there are books uh, of the Bible. So it's a large book. It has a unique historical context and, you know, in advance of the fall of Judah. Uh, so it has political, uh, geopolitical things are happening. And uh, Isaiah was used by God to call for the correction of injustice, a call uh, of obedience for the people, uh, punishment for evildoers. So Isaiah contains um, also some of the most amazing predictions of the coming Messiah. He urged Judah to repent and reminding them that salvation is found in, in God alone. Now last week, Harvey shared Isaiah 41, the first 16 verses, I'm going to take the next section of that chapter. Harvey shared with us uh, the portrait of God as Redeemer, the author of redemption. And if we look back to verse 14, uh, uh, there God reveals himself as the one who is going to help, and he, he declares himself to be the Redeemer the Holy One of Israel. And so Isaiah was proclaiming God's reliability, God's rescue, and really the only true answer to our anxiety or worry uh, that we might have. Now, Harvey also mentioned a very fancy word. It's not a term from the Old Testament. It's actually a term uh, from the Greek language, didacticon. And he said, what, you know, this group, didacticon, what, what is this group? And I just, wanna, I just wanna dispel any concerns that this is some secret society that's growing up within our church. This is a group of us uh, in the picture, uh, Harvey's, Har uh, maybe Harvey was taking the picture and we're also missing, uh, no, Shane was taking the picture and Harvey was away. But there's six of us. And essentially the word didacticon means teaching. And so we study the Bible together in order to present it to others. And in particular, we're talking about this 
you know, being a, a preaching team. So as different ones are coming and sharing a different portrait of Isaiah, that's, that's our preaching team. And just in case you were worried, um, we haven't kicked Harvey off the didacticon. He's still, he's still a member in good standing for now. Um, um, but it's, it's a privilege. It's such a privilege to uh, sh- uh, study God's word together and help each other uh, in presenting it. Today, let's look at Isaiah 41, beginning at verse 17. We'll go to the end of the chapter, to verse 29. And we're looking at a portrayal of God as the Lord of the past and future. Uh, Now, we've already mentioned maybe more than once that Old Testament prophecy is uh, a corrective call Um, even more so than it's a predictive call. Is there a predictive element in it? Yes, the future is in view. But it's primarily um, uh, bringing restoration and bringing a call to repentance. And so in the case uh, that we have before us today, uh, beginning at verse 17, it, it does present as almost as if it's a court case. Um, it, we, we have uh, this picture of God as it touches the way we look about the past or the way we look at the future. And so I want to look at um, three sections. It kind of breaks down into three sections. And in each of these sections, there's a different longing and need and concern uh, of our hearts that God himself is the corrective response to those things. So we'll begin with what I call the lure of longing. And I'm going to read verses 17 through 20. The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. But I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia and the myrtle and the olive. I will set pines in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together, so that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. So what, if, what is this lure of longing that we have in our hearts as humans? I mean, obviously we're looking at a passage that talks about water. So we, we know quite intimately when we get thirsty, the longing for water. And I had to, I had to uh, visit other places in the world to really appreciate this. Because growing up on Vancouver Island, and then we lived for a while uh, in Euclid on the west coast of Vancouver. Vancouver Island, and it only rains there twice a week, once for three days and once for four. And, and so it wasn't until I had gone to other places that were less moist uh, that I appreciated not have, you know, this issue of not having water. But God is using this picture uh, to portray himself as the only true source of of both our satisfaction, what we need, uh, also uh, care uh, uh, for us in in the way he'll shelter us. These rivers in the desert that is described here, uh, that might make us reflect back on Israel's experience in their wilderness wandering, how they were without water and God miraculously provided water for them, literally in the desert. I think what's interesting is that we look back in an earlier passage of Isaiah, we see more of this expression of the need for water. I'm picking it up at Isaiah 35, uh, verses 1 and 2. And there we read, The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. And what, what is the glory of Lebanon, right? The cedars, the beautiful trees, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. And then down to verse 6. 
Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. I want you to lock into your mind for our conclusion that little phrase, streams in the desert. I'll explain it uh, at at the end. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground, bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. Um, Can you think of what that meant to people to hear? Because they understood what dry, dusty, desert uh, environment was like. And not only water uh, that satisfies, but then also uh, trees were mentioned. There's seven, I counted seven different kinds of trees. You know, having grown up on Vancouver Island and then spent some time in school in Alberta and people would talk about trees. I said, that's, that's not a tree. Come out to Vancouver Island, then you see a tree. You know, you get tired walking around the base of it. That, that, that's a tree, like um, uh, Cathedral Grove there near Port Alberni. Those are trees. But in, in this case, we've got seven different trees, and I think the variety is for emphasis. God is able, not, not just to provide water in the desert, but he's able to provide all of these trees. And I think it really symbolizes his ability to care for us. We've got these longings and desires, and we think we're going to figure it all out on our own. And yet God is the only one that can truly satisfy us. And maybe even further, the trees are symbolic of shelter and shade and protection. So what often is the focus of our longings? I thought about this and I I put it just simply in the past and the future. Isn't it interesting? The past and the future, those are both, they're, they're exactly the same in this sense. We don't live there. One place we used to live there and the other, we don't live there yet. But in both cases, it's not our current experience. What do we think about the past? Well, it, re- it might represent what we wish had been, or it might represent what we wish had not been, right? So there's a, a great tendency to regret. Oh, I wish, I wish I hadn't said that. That might be the very recent past, right? Even just moments after something comes out of our mouth, we say, oh, I really regret saying that. I wish that had not happened in the past. Or I wish I, 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 it was a missed opportunity. I, I wish I had done something. And um, if we were in the context of Isaiah, this may well have been the struggle for the people. Oh, I wish things had worked out for, better for us as a people. All the way along, though, Isaiah is saying, it's not regret. That's not the answer. The answer is repentance. Um, Turn that sorrow, turn that failure, turn that um, disobedience back over to God in the form of repentance and godly sorrow and receive his forgiveness. Now we also think about the future. Um, It offers, this offers what we wish will be, or maybe it's uh, more of a fear, uh, a worry, a concern. We don't we don't want it to be. Um, you know, I, I, I struggled emotionally Friday night, and then I learned on Saturday morning I wasn't alone. Many of the other guys at the men's breakfast also had struggled through the Canucks game on Friday night, wondering if we were going to win or not. And, you know, where hearts were strengthened, we're moving on. You know, we're moving on to the second round. But we think about the future. What will happen? Well, for the people of Israel, captivity was coming. The the, um, final straw, if you will, had had occurred in terms of their ongoing failure and punishment was coming. And so there was things to fear. But what God was revealing was he continued to be to them all that they needed if they would only turn back to him. We can neither change the past or control the future, Have you, or, or, unless you've figured out a way to do that. I haven't. I would suggest we're all in the same situation there. Earlier in chapter 41, the first couple of verses, uh, verses 2 through 4, God makes it very clear that he controls history. And as followers of Jesus, we really need to settle into this reality that, that God is our eternal and present help. Verse 17 tells us, 
I, the Lord, will answer them myself. As the God of Israel, I will not abandon them. And if that was the true of his character, then it is true of his character now. There's something vital about seeing God alone as the one who can answer our longings. Verse 20, uh, so that they might see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of the Lord has done this. This, is, this, this rescue, this deliverance, uh, this um, purpose, in spite of your disobedience, uh, when I restore you, I have a purpose for you. This is God creating that. Now, we've got a phrase that I, I don't know if you use it, but I've heard this comment. I need to live what? I need to live in the... In, in, in Maple Ridge? No. In, in the moment. You no, know, in, in Albion, or if we really want to go upscale, Wanick, right? Um, I, w I need to live in the moment. And this is not bad. Uh, it's not bad advice. But I would suggest, if we're not careful... What that really has the, has the notion of, I need to be present in myself, in my situation, and we might even find someone who will say, in my personal truth, right? And it, it might not contain the word self or sufficiency, but I would suggest it really points, if we take it to its logical conclusion, uh, I, need, I, I need to be sufficient in myself and block out all the distraction. I need to just live in the moment and not worry about the past or not worry about the future, but just live in the now, right? And it sounds very tantalizing advice. But what God is saying, don't live in your now, live in my now. Live in me, live in the presence of God. And so the lure of longing is that we'd even get to the point so close to the answer that we'd, oh, I'm not going to worry about the past. I'm not going to fret about the future. I'm just going to live in my now. We're so close. What we need is God, right? What we need is a revelation, a portrayal, an understanding of who God is, and that he, just as he, as he makes an argument for us here, I'm the only one that is in control of these things. Rest in me. So not just being in your or my personal moment, but being uh, at peace and at rest in the very presence of God. And that's what he offers to us. There is another challenge before us, and that is the peril of presuming. And we pick that up in verse 21. And really, this is you know, where we kind of get, it's almost like a courtroom setting. Verse 21, present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments says Jacob's king. Bring in your idols and tell us what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know you are God's. Do something, whether good or bad, so that we will be dismayed and filled with fear. But you are less than nothing, and your works are utterly worthless. He who chooses you is uh, detestable. So, indeed, God is really acting. It's like a, it's like a court case. Um, present your case. You know, bring, bring the evidence. Make, make a case. And what, what is this case? That in ourselves, in our humanity, we might possibly know or sense or predict or, or even just plan for and try and c can contrive some goal for the future. Or we might try to reconcile and sort through and make sense of our past in ourselves. And so this is what we might call the sin of presumption. I was reading in 1 Samuel 15, 23, and when Saul, the first king of Israel, was really getting into difficulty um, and, and strain in his relationship with God, uh, Samuel challenged him of, of this sin of, of presuming or a stubborn, insubordinate kind of attitude. And really what we're doing is if we say that we can make sense in ourselves of either the past or the future, we 
are really challenging God's control, challenging God's sovereignty over, over those things. It's a really interesting rhetorical device that Isaiah is using. If we turn back to chapter 40, it's really a, a series of questions. You know, who can do this? Who can do that? Who can do this? This is a, a challenge from God. It sounds a bit harsh, but he's really saying, you can't predict the future. In, in any ultimate sense, you, you can't make sense of what has gone on before. It almost sounds mocking, but it's a challenging way that God is encouraging uh, these people to either uh, show that they know the future or truly submit to the God of the future. The conclusion is in verse 24, uh, you're less than nothing, your work is less than nothing. You're, you don't have the capacity all the while, God is trying to get them to see that he does, and he will carry us. Uh, Amy Carmichael was a, a missionary of many, many years ago. She was going through a very difficult time working as she was at that time in India. It was a very difficult experience, and she had lost and was grieving for some co-workers and some friends who had passed and someone was trying to console her with the idea of, you know, just, um, you know, how, how could this have been f for the best? It's hard to see. And her answer was this, we're not asked to see. Why need we when we know? Now, she wasn't saying that she knew the future. She was saying that in her faith relationship with God, she had the knowing of faith. The, the, the rest of, of knowing that God had a purpose beyond her ability to see. So we're not asked to see. God isn't saying you should see the future. He's challenging us to acknowledge we can't see the future. But he's inviting us into a quite a different place to really anticipate that God is already doing in the future his good purposes specifically for us if we will just walk in a trust, faith relationship with him. Uh, I always appreciated when my aunt would write a letter and she would include the words DV, the, the little uh, initials, DV, which stands for uh, Deo uh, Volente. What is it in Latin? God willing, right? If God wills. And we're told in James chapter 4, if uh, we are presumptuous. We'll make all kinds of plans. Hey, uh, next year we're doing this and we're going there and we're going to do this. And I, we, we, we map out our future without, you know, trust and faith and, and uh, submission to God. And James says that's, that's not the walk of faith. The walk of faith says we'll endeavor to do this as God wills, as God leads us, as God enables us. So that is the peril of presuming, and we're invited into a much different place than uh, thinking we can, we can make sense of the past or the future, but actually acknowledging that we cannot, but God will lead us, uh, lead us as we trust in him. So the last um, challenge before us as it relates to the past or the future, I think, is the weakness of our wisdom, verses 25 through 29. God says this, I've stirred up one from the north and he comes, one from the rising sun who calls on my name. So someone who will come from the north, but also from the east where the sun rises. And we're having another reference of Cyrus, uh, who is the emperor of Persia. And God goes on to say, he treads on rulers as, as if they were mortar, as if he were a potter treading the clay. Who told of this from the beginning so we could know? Or beforehand so we could say, he was right. No one told of this. No one foretold it. No one heard any words from you. I, God speaking, was the first to tell Zion, look, here they are. I gave to Jerusalem a messenger of good tidings. I look, but there is no one. No one among them to give counsel. No one to give Answer when we, I ask them. See, they are all false. Their deeds uh, ab uh, about, uh, amount to nothing. Their images are but wind and confusion. So the weakness of our human wisdom is clearly documented. You could turn to 1 Corinthians 
uh, chapter uh, 1, Paul makes a, a pretty strong argument that God, when, when it comes to God bringing his truth to bear on our situation, you know, human, even the highest form of human wisdom is like foolishness. Now, God is also um, arguing for that here. Now, no one predicted that Cyrus would come into the picture. No, no, no one understood um, my purposes here, you know, your, your resources are completely inadequate. In verse 26, uh, he says, there's, there's no human who could reason out God's purposes. Their, their message would be unreliable. Their response would be unreliable. Only God is qualified to declare his perfect promise of deliverance to his people. See that in verse 25 and, and also in verse 27. So even though the rebuke found in verse 28 is harsh, it's, that's no question, it is harsh, but it is the, the reality. Uh, no different, I suppose, than a very painful, difficult uh, health diagnosis would feel harsh. It would feel painful to hear that I have this issue or I have this disease, but it's the truth that I need to hear so that I will find an answer, that I'll find uh, some kind of healing. Only God uh, can reason these things true, through. Uh, humanity, there's no counselor among them, as it were. Their, their human uh, wisdom and strategies are false or, or they work nothing. That's in verse 28. There's a wind and emptiness in this idolatry. And you can imagine, you know, the people of Israel uh, having all the resource they need in God and yet turning their backs on him and turning to idols uh, that did not uh, answer their deepest needs. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One. The same title as we're thinking about in Isaiah. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So where God's wisdom, in God's truth, in his character? And so today, for us, it really begs the question, where are we rooting our wisdom? What, what's giving us advice I'll never forget the day that I think our, I think it was our oldest son, but one of our kids came to us, I think it was around 16 or 17, and he said, Dad, I've got this question, serious question, can I ask you for your advice? And I thought, I've been waiting for this, you know, ever since he turned 13, that he'll actually ask me for advice, so I was ready, and I think probably gave him one of the best dad answers possible in human history, and he said, okay, thanks, I think I'll check with my friends, you know? And, and this took me from the heights of dadhood down to the reality, <laughs> you know. There was a time, there was a time when we had four, uh, they were all teenagers, four of them at the same time, and I said, Delano, we'll never be more irrelevant than we are at this moment. Um, but we're, we're thankful that's turned around. But it does beg the question, where do you get your advice? Where do you get your wisdom? Where do you get guidance for your life? And I know it's difficult. You, you know, we're we're in this journey together of saying, I got I got to make a I got to make a financial decision. It doesn't it doesn't tell me. Even I looked in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It doesn't tell me what kind of car I should purchase. You know, I, I looked I looked in the Bible and it didn't tell me whether I should go into. Um, you know, ed education at university or, or engineering, right? I, I looked all through the scripture. And so I understand this notion that we want very specific, very practical, very detailed direction for our lives. And failing to get that, we sometimes say, well, yeah, it's great. It, you know, that's all well and good for Pastor Brent to tell me that I should seek God's wisdom. But, you know, what is that wisdom for this particular step in my journey. And I think uh, a lot of the answer is not in the particular details, it's in the person of God. It's in resting ourselves deep into who the person of God is. I, I don't know why it happened this way, but I have a, a several old, old missionaries on my mind here for, for examples, and one of whom is Hudson Taylor, who uh, many, many years ago went to China 
um, many, many, many decades ago. And, he's, and at near, nearing the end of his life, he made this confession. And this was a great man of God, uh, uh, wonderfully used of God. And he said this, I'm so weak, I cannot write. I cannot read my Bible. I cannot even pray. I can only lie still in God's arms like a little child and trust. And I'm not sure if he should have said, I can only. You know, I think he could have said, the best thing I can do is I can just lie still in God's arms like a little child and trust. And I think it's in the developing and the nurturing and the growing of that intimate relationship with God that then when we come to the particular details of our lives, we have a sense of peace and clarity because we, we're resting in who God is. And then he gives us clarity about those um, more, more minor decisions. And I don't think we'll miss God's will, you know, if we get a red car versus a blue car, right? There, but there are some other guiding principles. We're not going to spend every dollar we possibly can on a, you know, on a car that's out of our reach. We'll, we'll be reasonable and a good steward. There are principles, but I think it's really not just being led by principles, it's by being in relationship with a person. So the question I'll conclude with is, are we beholding God? Are we really looking to him, looking to his strength? And if we're not resting in him, it's going to be very uh, tempting to become morose about the past and our failures and what we wish could or could not have been, where we might be conniving and manipulating about the future because we've got to avoid difficulties and try and arrange things, but we need to rest in God. We need the knowing of faith, not human presumption. And this is where I just want to circle back to that little phrase from Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 6. I asked you to just tuck away and it's the phrase streams in the desert. Streams in the desert is the title of of a devotional book written by Letty Kalman. Now, um, I've got a copy here. Uh, it's not a recent copy. It's, uh, next year, this will be 100 years old. It kind of made, uh, I didn't buy it originally. Um, <laughs> just, just in case someone was wondering. Um, so I realize that the, the language here is going to sound old. But I, I, I think it's really our experience for today, just for this moment, just for this time of thinking about what God is saying to us through this passage. You see, uh, her writing has impacted a lot of people. Uh, this book, Streams in the Desert, has impacted a lot. You might not have heard of it, but it has been very well received over, over almost 100 years. And I want to just read a little bit of her story uh, that she writes in the in the forward, just to see uh, what God was doing in her experience and how that translated into so much blessing for others. She writes, it was, and her husband, uh, Charles, and her were, were missionaries. Uh, she said, it, it, it was our privilege to spend a number of years in the mission fields of the Orient, Japan and Korea, but the trying climate and overstrain of heavy work caused my dear husband's health to fail and we were compelled to return to the homeland where for six years a battle was waged between life and death. So this is a, a, a woman wondering, you know, having come back from serving God uh, back home and now she's wondering if her husband's going to live or die. Then cometh Satan tempted us to faint under the pressure, but each time when the testings had reached their utmost limit, God would illumine some old and familiar text, or a helpful book or tract would providentially fall into our hands, which contained just the message needed at the moment. One day, we were walking along the seashore, wondering almost if God had forgotten to be gracious. A little leaflet lay at our feet. We picked it up and read, God smiles on his child in the eye of the storm. And we caught anew a glimpse of his loving face. And then she writes, and here's, the language is old, but it's very true. His choicest cordials were kept for our deepest fainting. So cordials, uh, a drink, his choicest refreshing drink were kept for our deepest struggling times. 
and we have been held in his strong, loving arms these trying years till we have learned to love our desert. That's, that's I think, the transformative message of Isaiah 41 is that we can come to love the desert season because of who God is. Not because we can make sense of the past or the future, but because of who God is. And she says, Lottie Kalman says, we have learned to love our desert because of his wonderful presence with us. Our own trouble has drawn us to hundreds of troubled hearts. And we have tried to comfort them with the same comfort wherewith we have been comforted of God. And so she simply says, this book is sent forth with a prayer that many a weary, wayworn traveler may drink therefrom and be refreshed. Let's bow in prayer. Yeah, Lord, we simply ask that you would refresh us today. Not, don't um, refresh us with just a better version of ourselves. Keep us and rescue us from that, I pray. But refresh us with a fuller, more clear, more profound understanding of who you are. Lord, if there's anyone here who's in a desert season, I pray that they would learn to love the desert, not, not, not because it's a pleasant place, but because you are present and they will not faint. You will, you will pour out rivers of refreshing water. You will plant trees. You will watch over them. So help them to lean into that, lean away from any self-reliance and lean completely upon you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.